Good afternoon. Oh, good morning still. Um, uh, my name is Uday Mehta, and I teach uh, political theory at the Graduate Center of the City University in New York. Uh, I will be moderating this session. Uh, the session is called, Is Protest Political? Uh, I think uh, that's a very important question. Uh, and I think it's an important question because the answer isn't obvious. Uh, I think we've gotten accustomed to the notion that protest is always political because everything is always political. Uh, I happen to think uh, uh, this kind of colonization of politics, of everything, uh, uh, is dangerous, but that's my view. In any case, uh, uh, we're uh, very fortunate to have uh, two speakers, uh, Mika White and Zephyr Teachout. Uh, I think it is a compliment to them that they are both uh, unsuccessful uh, candidates in elections. Uh, those of us, like myself, who believe there is more to success than victory, uh, think that the candidates, uh, the, the, the campaigns they ran uh, and the things that they have done uh, as part of their failure as candidates uh, is perhaps more important uh, than victory. Uh, so I appreciate them and I commend them to you as people who have failed. Um, <coughs> uh, 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 they're both professors, they're both authors, um, uh, they're both uh, public intellectuals. Uh, I, I shan't say more. Uh, uh, about them, uh, I think you're probably familiar with both. Uh, Mika was a co-founder of um, Occupy, and uh, again, my interest in that was it was a form of politics that was interesting in part because of the form it took and not the demands it made. Um, uh, Zephyr, again, has... Uh, done many important things. Uh, as a New Yorker, I feel her candidacy in the gubernatorial elections uh, was it something that, I, that truly inspired me. So uh, without more ado, uh, Mika, why don't you? So Mika will speak first, then uh, Zephyr, and then hopefully we'll have a conversation. <laughs> All right. Um, Thank you for the introduction. It is, a, it is actually a real, it's a real honor um, and a privilege to be here. So thank you so much to Roger and Tina um, for organizing. When I heard the president of Bard give that talk, I went to Swarthmore and I was like, wow, I wish I had gone to Bard because that was an extremely sophisticated and interesting analysis of the situation that didn't just fall into like the liberal and progressive paradigms or into conservatism. So that was, it was beautiful. So it's actually a real great, it's a real great honor to be here. Um, I think all of us in this room understand the importance of this topic that we're discussing, the crises in democracy. And I think that we understand also the severity of this topic. We are talking about a situation where if things go the wrong way, it's like nuclear Armageddon or something, you know? Like, this is a serious topic that we're discussing. I think at the same time, you know, if we're going to find a way forward, then we do need to break out of our comfort zones. Um, and I really appreciated uh, Leon's talk for starting to do that. So I'm going to preface my brief introduction. I'm going to give a very brief introduction, and then we're going to go on to it. A conversation by saying that I am going to say some things that are going to make you uncomfortable. You know, it just happens inevitably that I do this. And so I've started to give all of my talks first. And I say this because to me, it's very important that when you hear something that makes you uncomfortable, don't run from it. 
Mark it down, write it down, because the best ideas are often the things that make us uncomfortable. I'm going to say things that will make different people uncomfortable for different reasons. So just take a note of it. Um, all right, let's get into it. So, so the topic of this conversation is, is protest political? I've been an activist my entire life. I've been protesting since the age of 13. I've always been an independent activist, outsider activist. Um, when I was 28, I came up with the idea for Occupy Wall Street in collaboration with Kala Lassen, the, the founder and editor of Adbusters. I was working at Adbusters magazine at the time. So the two of us came up with the idea. We released it into the world. Ultimately, they spread to 82 countries. So my, thank you. So my entire life, thank you. My entire life has been activism. Um, and so now that I have, I have a two-year-old son now, and I've always dream, I'm dreaming about, oh, wouldn't it be so beautiful if he becomes an activist even greater than I? And so um, I've started to teach him the basic concepts of activism. He, he's two. He's born with an innate sense of activism, as all toddlers are, because they, they cry and they protest and they get things. Um, but I've started to, you know, talk to him about these concepts. What are these words? What are these words that we use? So the first word we, we learned together was activism. And if you talk to him and you say to him, what, first if you say, are you an activist? He says, yes. And then you say, what does an activist do? He says, change the world. That's beautiful, right? And I think it's really great. Um, the first time we did that, it really brought tears to my eyes. Um, but today, as I was preparing to come to this conference, um, I said to him, uh, you know, what is protest? And he looked at me kind of quizzically. And if he doesn't know what something is, he said, if you say what is protest and he doesn't know what it is, he just says, what is? So he said to me, what is? You know, what is protest, dad? And then all of a sudden I realized, well, that's very complicated to explain right now because I think, and this is one of the arguments that I want to make, is I don't think protest actually exists right now. And this gets at the question of, is protest political? Um, I think that protest is either doesn't exist or is fundamentally broken. And I want to say that because I think that authentic protest, which would be protest that's actually aimed at political goals such as capturing sovereignty, doesn't exist. What do we do when we protest? Let's take a step back. What, do activists, what are activists doing when we protest? Well, one thing that we're doing, I think, is we're acting out a story about democracy. What we're doing is we're trying to manifest some sort of collective will. Um, you know, if you look at the Declaration of Independence or even the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, it contains within there the central core myth of democracy, which is that the authority of the government rests upon the consent of the governed. Okay? So from an activist perspective, what we're doing when we do large-scale marches or occupations is we're saying, look, we're showing you our discontent. We're manifesting a sovereignty that's higher than our elected representatives. We are a, dem we're a democratic force, a force of democracy. We're the manifestation of true democracy. And my argument would be that actually that doesn't work anymore and that's not true. That that form of sovereignty, that popular sovereignty, doesn't work. It, it doesn't exist. And so protest is broken is connected to this question of the crisis in democracy. Um, I think that I think that there's a second aspect to this, which is that, and I, I just want to say historically, sometimes I start to think about, well, when did this happen, this transition moment? And I think one of the key, key moments in the kind of death of popular sovereignty or the breakage of protest was really the February 15, 2003 global anti-war march. If people remember that day, I was there, I almost got trampled by a police horse, I was in New York City. The entire world, it was amazing, the entire world protested together on one day saying no to the war. We had one demand. If you look at the pictures of London, there's like 100,000 people with one sign just said no to the war. And George Bush got on television and he said, uh, I don't listen to, pro to focus groups. I don't listen to focus groups. So he called all of the global protests a focus group. And one month later, he went to war. I think this was the defining moment when Western democracies basically said, no, the people cannot manifest a sovereignty greater than us outside of elections through street protest. And I think it's taken activists like, we don't want to believe that. That's the central myth of activism. Why would we want to believe? You know. The second thing I want to say about protest is I actually think that one of the fundamental problems is that activists maybe unconsciously sensing that sovereignty is broken somehow or protest is broken, 
that activists, especially on the left, are not actually revolutionaries anymore. They're actually not political. They actually don't believe in taking sovereignty and governing. Like, and this, this, this always blows my mind because I say this, and then people are like, no, no, that's not true. But then I say, uh, well, do you want to, do you actually want to overthrow Trump and then, and then govern? And they're like, no. And if you actually talk to most activists, they don't, either out of some sort of naive anarchism or some sort of fear, like, well, if we did that, then we would become like Stalin. You know, like, they, they, we've actually kind of, we, we don't, the left has so much trauma around the, 20th, the, the, the revolutions of the 20th century that I think that we just don't really believe in that anymore. And so I think that protest has become, like, you've all heard this phrase, um, we change the discourse right? We've changed the discourse. Um, so what that is, is that's not revolution, that's social marketing. And so protest, protest has become social marketing, a very effective form of social marketing. Occupy Wall Street, this is amazing. Occupy Wall Street, we launched Occupy Wall Street with like no money. It, within uh, about a month, 50% of Americans had heard of the movement. It's <laughs> amazing, okay? The same thing happened with Black Lives Matter, right? With almost no money at all, you can create something, an idea that 100 million people can hear about. So from a social marketing perspective, protest is extremely valuable and amazing and great. And you can spread memes, you can change the discourse, you can raise awareness, but you cannot take political power. So what does that mean for activists moving forward? And then I'm going to go into this conversation. It means that there's only two ways left to capture sovereignty. Okay, you can win wars or you can win elections. That's it. That's the only two ways remaining for people to capture sovereignty in our world. Donald Trump demonstrated that winning, war, uh, winning elections is possible. Um, you know, groups like ISIS have shown to a limited extent that maybe you can do some sort of war route. Um, so I think you can use protests to win elections or you can use protests to win wars, but you cannot use protests alone to capture sovereignty. And I, I believe in the elections route. I think strategically, morally, I think there's countless reasons why elections should be the way you, that we should go. Um, I ran for mayor in a tiny rural town, which we can talk about that experience. But the main takeaway that I want to get across is I think that the concept that we need to be really thinking about now is where does the, author where does the sovereignty of the people derive? Where, where does it come from? And if, if it is true that we live in a situation where the basic myth of democracy that the consent of the authority of the government derives from the consent of the people is no longer true, then I think we're in a very, very dark situation. And I think as activists, we have to acknowledge that situation and then fight back by trying to capture sovereignty as quickly as we can. And that means building a social movement that can win elections. Thank you very much. Thank you. Look forward to the conversation, it's great. Um, thank you for that introduction and for that great uh, introductory talk. Um, so some of you know me because you voted against me, some of you know me because you voted for me. <laughs> um, and just uh, before I talk about uh, the, the question of protest, I would say that my own experience is uh, not just those two campaigns, but I've been involved in politics, local politics, for a long time. Um, I tried to start an Occupy Wall Street. We called it a new way forward. It didn't work. <laughs> but we were determined to break up big banks, and we had rallies with, uh, we had like 95 rallies around the country. So, you know, nothing. And the, uh, the chant was nationalize, reorganize, decentralize. I can't imagine why it didn't work. <laughs> So I failed in many ways today. <laughs> um, and also then, you know, been very fascinated with protest and power and been to many Tea Party events as well as uh, uh, spent time at Occupy Wall Street on the legal team. Um, and we can talk about uh, s some of the really interesting lessons that came out of that as well. But thinking about this question about protest and politics, um, I, I want to introduce a somewhat cheap dichotomy. <laughs> And those Thoreau scholars can beat me up later. <laughs> but that there's basically two, I think, at least two major strands from which civil disobedience um, and protest come in this country. And one strand I would largely identify with Thoreau and the other with King, with Martin Luther King, who of course also learned directly and indirectly uh, from Thoreau. 
um, Thoreau's essay on civil disobedience and King's essay, The Letter from the Birmingham Jail, being these two very different models. And the thing that is so striking about King's letter, um, uh, first of all, important things about King's letter is that he does not start with protest, but starts actually in the four-step process that he almost talks about as a time-tested process for, uh, for protest. He starts with, first, we collect the facts. Then we negotiate. Then we self-purify. And by self-purify, he means prepare for the inevitable attacks. And then we take direct action. Um, and negotiation is a central part of his story in a letter to a Birmingham jail. In fact, what he talks about in a letter to Birmingham jail, and then taking this very radical action. One of the things he talks about in a letter to Birmingham jail is the importance of dialogue as opposed to monologue. In King's letter, he speaks from a place of uh, profound morality, profound love, and a desire to create tension, which then creates the possibility for power. Um, Thoreau was protesting slavery. Um, and Thoreau's uh, civil disobedience is very much about himself and his discomfort with the fact of government and the fact of law itself. Uh, it's a long letter, so I'm not going to go through all of it, but it's mostly about how can he live with himself given what uh, his government is doing. He asks himself, well, why don't I engage in, you know, what Mika would want him to engage in, the laws, the electoral system. And he says, and this is the only part I'm going to quote, as far as the ways the state has provided me for remedying the evil, I know of no such ways. They take too much time. And a man's life will be gone. And then he elaborates on this, saying, I don't really want to be involved in this. And so I see that the sort of fundamental difference here is that one form and tradition of protest is profoundly political in that it is creating tension, it is collective, its goal is change. And the other form, and I say this with great admiration of, for Thoreau, the other form has more to do with himself and who he is and whether or not he can live with himself. And in the past several decades, I believe a lot of protest, and by no means all, but a lot of protest in this country, has taken up a kind of lazy reading of King, um, and then uh, the spirit of, the, of Thoreau to make protest be about the self, what I can live with. And you hear this all the time. Just listen to your you know, radio station story of somebody who's newly involved in Indivisible. The story is, I could not live with it. I could not sit with it myself. It's about people's own need to sort of resolve the tension between what the government is doing and what they are doing, which is very different than starting with a purpose, not with the self. Um, so one of the things that this does, I mean, there's a lot of things this does, is that the, um, the sort of Thoreau strain then fits also very well with a modern kind of consumer politics. And I'm sure many of you have been in a room, how many of you are involved in the Indivisible or a local group, where people will say to you, you've got to find the thing you're passionate about and work on it, right? That sounds so good. Well, that sounds great. It's just like picking my favorite ice cream, right? <laughs> but the truth is, the idea of starting with what you are most passionate about, I'm not saying there's something wrong with that, if it happens to align with the good, but as opposed to asking where you see the wrong and what long-term strategic way you can engage in that, those are totally different kinds of questions. And there's this sort of consumer activism that has, consumer language that has infected a lot of protest. So it's about ourselves or about our expression or about our own sense of passion or meaning and not actually about taking on very serious people with incredible amounts of power, incredible amounts of power, both uh, you know, military and monetary power, charismatic power, um, and, uh, uh, and trying to actually change the way they behave so that people can live better. I mean, those are real, real differences. One of the real weaknesses, I think, then, so the answer, I mean, the cheap answer to the question, having given this sort of cheap dichotomy, is that 
um, protest can be political, but not all protest is political. And that protest is political when it recognizes that it is not about the self. It is not about sort of self-actualization, but about achieving some very real change in the material uh, well-being and structures of society. One of the great weaknesses of the um, uh, consumer uh, 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 self-oriented um, uh, way of thinking about protest is that it's not too hard to get you off track if you have that kind of approach. So in politics, we have a phrase that we call um, murder-suicide. Um, I, I worked on Howard Dean's presidential campaign in 2003, and Dick Gephardt in Iowa performed a murder-suicide. He attacked Howard Dean so strongly because he was coming up on him that both Gephardt and Dean fell to the bottom of the polls and this guy, uh, Edwards and Carey, floated above them. Uh, when I was at Occupy Wall Street, I saw Bloomberg engage in a murder-suicide. Bloomberg wiped out Occupy in a totally irresponsible way, trashing people's property. Bloomberg didn't look good. But the effect was he changed the structure and the way that Occupy Wall Street was working from a debate about taking on the banks to taking on police practices in New York City. And part of the reason that was possible for him to do is that people in that moment said, what the police are doing is wrong. I have to. I can't live with myself. I must protest this. I have to engage instead of staying on the, um, and not all people, but staying on the fundamental protest, which is the pro protest against concentrated financial power. Or at least as I saw it, I have to ask the founder <laughs> um, at Occupy Wall Street. And that was a radical shift. And right now, I believe we are in the middle of a major national murder-suicide with, um, with Trump, who repeatedly, repeatedly um, uh, engages in a way that is so offensive and so profoundly disturbing that we feel like we must respond, otherwise we cannot live with ourselves. <laughs> And in fact, it's not just that. It's like, I must, I must tweet. I am not a good person. I'm not a good citizen if I have not tweeted out my outrage about Trump's response to the NFL. And you feel it, even in your little circle of friends, like, oh my gosh, I haven't gotten on Twitter today. What, what if I want to say something about the whales? They'll give me... But it's, it's even worse than that. We actually demand of our leaders that they themselves do the same thing. We demand that they go off track. We demand that they respond to outrages. Because if they are not responding to outrage, they are not, in some ways, expressing who they are, as opposed to actually rebuilding society and rebuilding another model besides the Trump model. And I very much fear that if all we do is, is build a series of blocks against the incredibly cruel and careless um, and incompetent uh, and bigoted, um, uh, a president that we now have, if all we do is protect against that, at the same time we are actually not rebuilding a politics that we can live by and we'll have another kind of Trump character come again. So, um, what, let's see, a few last things and then we can um, uh, talk. Uh, and I want to have more of a conversation. So, I want to acknowledge, I feel, I feel like um, Bill McKibben, I feel like we're the sort of Bill McKibben panel, like it's even worse than you think. <laughs> um, and I think Mick might say the same thing, but um, that the depth of the problem we face is not something that can be fixed by doing, as much as I have strong feelings about protest and the way that we can do protest far more strategically with the goal of winning as opposed to expressing. <laughs> Um, but the goal, the, 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 the societal problems are deeper than just a slightly better activism or better protest. We actually have, uh, and uh, the president referred to some of these, but we have a society that is so profoundly disconnected that politics is very hard to do, politics in the sense of engaging and building power. 60 years ago in this country, 50% of Americans from any class sorry, 20% of Americans from any class, were presidents of their local voluntary association. Presidents. 
In fact, one of the sayings was, we have a nation of presidents, why do we need a president? If you go to the gravestones, cross class, cross race, you will see mention of, you know, mom, daughter, member of this local voluntary association. It was so deep, people were so profoundly involved in a kind of politics, whether it's the Elks Club or the Moose Club, or um, uh, involved in politics that one out of five people had taken on a leadership role in organizing people on a regular basis. So I know a handful of you raised your hand saying you'd be involved in indivisible or other local groups. They're annoying, right? Like people are strange and there's real battles to be won, won and fought and you lose them and there's strategy sessions and you disagree. If one in five people in this country are engaging in that level, not in some kind of pure way, but in the like annoying part of local politics, that's a way I can imagine our, our country getting transformed. But that's gonna take a lot more than, than mere thinking about this as the resistance. It's actually gonna take long-term work. So because I am an organizer, I do have to give you a hard time first. How many of you live in Dutchess County? Okay. How many of you have done any work for the 2018 congressional race? How many of you worked on the 2017 county legislature race? Okay, we got some hands. Right now in this county, there are county legislator races in a county that voted overwhelmingly for Hillary Clinton. Not, sorry, take away the overwhelmingly, barely for Hillary Clinton. <laughs> um, and uh, the county legislature is, um, has uh, almost three quarters Republicans on it. The county executive is Republican. If we think about power not as expression, but power creating, you're gonna be involved in your county legislature race, not 2018. You're not gonna be as engaged. And that means really changing the way that we think. This isn't about expression. This is about like long-term, highly local, sometimes annoying, very social work. And to Roger's point, that means going door to door or meeting with people and confronting them and meeting somebody who says, I think you should have a voter ID for every person who's voting and engaging with that person not turning them away. So when I was thinking about this question about what is political and what is not political, what is not political is when the goal of, polit of allegedly political action is the self. And what is political is when there's a willingness to engage, there's a willingness to create tension, there's a willingness to, to live in that tension. And the goal is actually um, change, not merely, uh, um, uh, not merely uh, sort of feeling like the soul is consistent with one's ideals. Thank you. Thank you uh, both. Uh, I'll open the uh, floor to questions, but perhaps I can start uh, with one of my own. Uh, I was being half serious when I said that I thought um, failing in an election could nevertheless be taken as a form of success. But now I realize that maybe the two of you, even though you've lost elections, perhaps don't take it as a form of success. Uh, because. I guess, Mika, one of the things that I'm struck by is that you end your talk by saying, look, uh, if you want sovereignty, you've either got to win wars or you've got to win elections. Uh, what I find puzzling about that is that one could have said, look, the th the mistake was in wanting sovereignty in the first place. Uh, and if the mistake was in wanting sovereignty in the first place, then you wouldn't be left with just two options. Okay? And I guess when I was in college, I was also part of various forms of protest. And part of what, was in, what for me was interesting about the protest was that one wasn't just trying to get power 
when he was trying to bring about a different vision of how to live. But I'm surprised by what you say because you seem to be saying, look, the whole game is power, so forget this talk about a different vision. Uh, let's just try and win elections. Yeah, that's a, that's a really excellent question. And there's a lot of, what happens is now that we're getting into this, there's a lot of nuance that I think I want to bring out in terms of this, this question. I, I, first of all, I do want to just say, yes, I think that there's been this game that we've been playing on the left, which is like, I'm not losing, I'm just winning at a different game. And you're like, no, you're literally losing. We are not the president. You know, like, we, we have lost. We, Occupy, Occupy was a constructive failure. Black Lives Matter failed. Like, this, you know, Women's March failed. The, the inability of the left to see that these things are failures and that we can learn from them keeps us, like, not progressing. So I absolutely do think that, I think that what happened is that, I do believe that what happened is that basically the traumas of the 20th century, the Stalins, the Mao, etc., has really forced us into the situation where we're scared of actually trying to take power, actually trying to achieve a literal political revolution. And so I think that there's a lot of interesting and, and beautiful thinking done around taking power without taking power, and maybe we don't need sovereignty. But I just think that I don't, I, I think it's mental gymnastics that I don't believe in, you know? And I think that, that with Occupy Wall Street, we, we tried that. That's what we were doing in the squares. We were trying to say, look, we're going to manifest a pure form of democracy literally in the squares, consensus-based. Anyone can come. It was beautiful. It was totally beautiful. But at the end of the day, when the police came to evict us, they listened to the mayor, not just a random assemblage of well-meaning people who were manifesting some pure form of democracy. And so what I'm trying to say is that I, I really do believe that we need to get back on track with saying that we might not like how the Russian Revolution turned out or the Chinese Revolution, but they were right about the idea that the only real solution is tr fundamentally taking f power and transforming how decisions are made. But that gets to your second question, which is, well, what kind of taking power are you talking about? Am I talking about um, becoming a Donald Trump? No, and that's not how I ran my campaign in Oregon. I really believe that we do need to transform how decisions are made. We need to transform how power functions but that the only way to do that is to take power. So I, in my imagination, I imagine something where someone becomes, some, some movement becomes president, and that movement makes decisions collectively as a movement, but that the movement is really the president, not the fake president, the shadow president, or you know, whatever, but the literal president, you know? Zephyr, I, I take it that on this last point, you're in complete agreement with Mika, right? Which last point? The, the last point. Being that, <laughs> what are you agreeing to? The last point being that, you know, look, in the distinction you make, you have Thoreau on the one hand becoming, and, you know, I don't think the way you made the distinction was crude or unsophisticated at all. I thought it was very well done. But Thoreau becomes a stand in for a certain kind of moralistic narcissism. Right? Mm -hmm. um, well said. Uh, and on the other hand, you have uh, politics. Right? The, the, and where I take you to be agreeing with Mika is in saying, yeah, look, uh, protest is about getting power. Is that right? I, mean, I think that's right. I think there's, there might be a slight disagreement, or there might not. But I, th I guess I would put it slightly different we, we, differently, which is I, um, I think that there has been a um, uh, sort of putting down of one of the most essential tools for um, uh, social change, which is elections. That there's been an incredible anxiety and fear and disdain and disgust for a long time. Um, on the left about that. Unlike Mika, I would not say it's all about that, therefore. I think the danger at any point is to say, you know, there's certain kinds of tools that I think are immoral to use, absolutely immoral. Um, but, but that electoral politics is an essential and moral tool, along with protest, along with um, other ways of gaining power. So I would not actually rush to the other extreme and say, therefore, everything has to be about electoral politics. I do think it matters who is elected, not just who they listen to. 
but um, politicians can change because of protest. And for those of you involved in the fracking movement in New York State, uh, nobody was, very few people were elected on an anti-fracking um, basis, but repeat protests truly changed a pretty serious fundamental policy in this state. Um, and that made a difference. So th I think there's lots of examples of protest working and not working. I totally agree with Mika that there's this fantasy that all protests always works. So I believe my race for governor was a successful failure. I believe my race for Congress, there's a few things I'm proud of about it, but on the whole, it was a failure, right? I lost. Um, I don't sort of, I don't see that, that there's a few things that I did in that campaign about the way in which we communicated ideas that I brought up that I feel good about, but I wouldn't say that, and I, so I think that one can distinguish between failing in electoral campaigns in a way that is successful and failing in a way that is unsuccessful instead of a default like patting each other on the back and like everything we did worked. And I think that lazy thinking is, I think that's what you're saying, is that we just got to not just say everything works and be able to distinguish between what works and what doesn't work. Uh, I guess, Mika, I thought you to be saying more than that. I thought you to be saying, and you just said, you know, Occupy failed, Black Lives, Lives Matter failed. And I, I happen to disagree with you because I, I myself think that uh, in the 40 years that I've lived in America, uh, nothing brought the issue of inequality on the table as conspicuously as Occupy did. Mm -hmm. For me, that's a huge success, okay? It's not a failure. And it does make me think that, I mean, the, the conception of failure that you have in mind, I, I, I guess, you know, uh, would you have said that uh, if the Civil Rights Act of 64 had not been passed, the civil rights movement was a failure? <laughs> I mean, I think this, this, is, this is what happens inevitably is we, after Occupy, I don't know, I don't know who started this language, but we all, I heard it everywhere, and you just said it, which is basically, Occupy was a success because all of a sudden we're talking about something that we had never been talking about. Yeah. Okay, now, as someone who was there in the very beginning, when we created this idea, the goal was not to get people to talk about something that was not talked about, okay? That was not the goal. And I will tell you, as an activist, that that's like a byproduct, okay? That's a, it's, a, it's an absolute, Occupy, look, you have to remember, it's been a while, I'll remind everyone, Occupy spread to 82 countries and 1,000 different cities. The entire world, basically, was involved in Occupy. If you create anything like that, people will, will start talking about something, okay? It's, so the talking about income inequality is just a byproduct. And a lot of activists, it's a symptom. A lot of activists have now turned that into, well, that was our, that's, our, that's our metric of success. And what I'm saying is if you do that, we will never win, okay? If you create a movement that spreads to 82 countries, it will always result in people talking about something. But if, you create your, if your goal is to make people talk about something, then you will never have revolutionary change. So I think that this, it hinges on, though, getting back to this question of failure, what is failure, what is success? The reason I call Occupy Wall Street not a, fail, not a total failure, I call it a constructive failure. So maybe this gets a little bit of this question of a successful failure. And what I say by constructive failure is that it taught us something about activism. It taught us that we don't have to do it again. We don't have to repeat Occupy Wall Street. We don't have, and I think this is the lesson that was lost on Black Lives Matter, you know, is that basically they came out of Occupy Wall Street and they said, we need to do it again, but more militant and more blocking of the streets. And they spread to like two countries and they didn't, you know, and it was beautiful and it was great. And I, as a black man, I agree with the sentiment. But on the other hand, I'm like, if you want to, if you want to, if you want to stop police killing, become the police or at least become the force that appoints the police. And this is what was completely lost on, on, on. So, so I think what I'm trying to say is that you know, I believe in, 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 in revolution, and a revolution is a change in legal regime. It's a change in who actually decides the laws. And I think that what we have to really address here is that I don't think that activists believe in revolution anymore. 
I think we believe in other things. And I think that some of the stuff, that, and I, I think that's fine. I'm not saying it's a bad thing, but I think we should just be honest with ourselves. And I think some of the stuff you're saying is indicative of that. And I think that it's quite common. And that maybe, that's, maybe I'm wrong to believe in revolution, but I just want us to get that out there and say, hey, we don't believe in this thing anymore. And so we're moving on into other things, you know? Let's take some questions. Uh, yes, uh, um, hi, can you hear me? Uh, Mike Diedrich. I was in Iraq for a year as an army lawyer, and, and uh, I saw tribes there, and it was interesting because I came back here and people said, oh, they're tribal there. And I said, well, it's like the tribe of Democrats in you know, Queens and the tribe of Republicans in uh, upstate counties. We're all tribal. So my question regarding this whole topic, is protest political? I, I think the better question is, is protest useful for liberal democracy? And my suggestion is that protest is tribal. And when we protest, we're trying to get our tribe, you know, up in arms and politically active. And with, if we get enough tribes behind us, we win elections. So I, th I think protest is a tool to mobilize one or more tribes, but that to win in politics, you have to look at humans as being tribal. And I think we do, and I think Democrats think of, in general, as tribe being America. I think of Republicans as being more tribe being the Republican Party. But I think if we forget the, the tribal nature of human beings, we're missing something. And I think for democracy to work, we have to realize that people are tribal and we have to address getting the tribes behind us and that that is the aspect where protest is useful if we get a, the tribes supporting sound liberal democracy. Any comments? So thank you for the, the comment. I think that is uh, sometimes quite true. When you talk to people who have been at a protest, the language they use is very much about a feeling of usness, implying or expressly talking about them, one or the other. Um, it's about an emotional feeling of, of being crowds. I happen to, um, uh, like the first protest I went to, I pretended I had to go make a phone call. I happen to not be very comfortable with that, <laughs> that feeling, but, I, but I, know that, I know that feeling you're talking about, about being in a large group concert-like. I do not think all protest is that way. Um, I think that some protest is very particularly, so I would sort of separate the tactic from other, it's, it's sometimes that way, and I think it's a really, really important thing to recognize. But sometimes it is very much about leveraging a very important power source, uh, which I would not dismiss as much as you do, but um, the ability to reach uh, 15,000 people if you're in a small area, or millions of people, it's leveraging the press. Um, and uh, that is an incredibly central part of a lot of protest actions, is sort of explicitly engaging with the press. Um, I'm not a Tea Party fan, as you can probably guess. Um, but I, so not but. And I watch them very explicitly leverage and, and sophisticatedly use the press to um, seem bigger than they were. There's often a sting. If you guys haven't seen the sting, those of you under 40. <laughs> A lot of great protest, successful protest, is based on the same sort of theory as, as the sting. Seeming bigger than you are, <laughs> you know, mirrors around the, um, the flamingos to make it seem like, it basically, it, you know, lots of mirrors to make it seem like you're larger than you are. Um, a, a, a sense of protest can, uh, in the example of fracking, make elected officials feel like there are more people than they are. This is where as you rightly pointed out, George Bush sort of punctured that and said, numbers aren't enough for me. Zainab Tufchecki has run, written some of the most interesting things that protest used to symbolize the numbers of people who supported it. But because of social media, now it's not that hard to organize a lot of people, and therefore it's not actually a sign of, so, of uh, organizing power to bring a lot of people together. But we still st sentimentally recall times when it was. So I think you're right that that is sometimes an essential part of it. And I think um, that we ought to be wary of that, that tribal uh, component. I just want to respond briefly to this question of tribal. I mean, I think that, I, I, I think that, the, that the most successful, uh, I think that social movements actually erupt when you 
cut across demographics. And this is what one of the powers of Occupy Wall Street was, is that, quite frankly, there were, there were end the Fed Ron Paul people there on the very first day of Occupy Wall Street. There were Tea Party people. And in, in a certain point in Occupy, right now we're all attuned to people bringing guns to protest. There were militia people who brought guns to protect Occupy Wall Street protesters in like Arizona and stuff. I remember this. Okay, so for me, Occupy was not firmly, it got labeled as left-wing movement, but its power came from being neither left nor right. And so one of the things that I think we need to do as Democrats, I'm not a Democrat, but as, as leftists, is to get out of this tribalism. Like, I came to, after I lost my, lost my election in, in Oregon, I came to New York to study the presidential campaign of Dr. Lenora Fulani. Okay, who in 1988, she became the first woman and the first black person to get on the ballot in all 50 states in America, which is something that the Green Party could not do in 2016. And what's amazing about this campaign is that I had never heard of it before because the left strongly dislikes this initiative because they were neither left nor right. And so it's been excluded from our knowledge. So I really think that it's very important to, to push the envelope and that Basically, when you're creative, the edge, the edge leads the pack, you know, and I think that we need to get out of our tribes, personally. Yes, right here. Hi, my name is Jesse Rebecca. I'm a public sector oh, here. Oh, was there? There's a mic. Thank you. Hello? Hello? Hello. My name is Jesse Levacon. I'm a poli-sci major here. Um, so, Zephyr, you talked about this idea of the depth of the problem and how we need a better form of activism or protest. And Micah, you ended your speech by saying we need to build a social movement that can win elections. So my question is loosely, like quickly, what is the ground game for that? Like what do we need to do logistically to build a ground game that can win elections? Okay, so very quick answer would be that Occupy Wall Street, the way you do as an activist is you, is you search for tactics that are being used elsewhere and you import them into a new environment. So Occupy Wall Street was literally, if you read the first briefing that we sent out, it was the merger of what was going on in Spain in that at that time, which was public consensus-based assemblies, which was what was going on in Egypt, which was going to some place of symbolic importance. So right now in Europe, oh my gosh, how lucky we are, there is a model for what I'm talking about. There's Podemos in Spain, there's the Five Star Movement in Italy, and there's the Pirate Party in Iceland, all three of which are social movements that have won elections. None of them are perfect, obviously, but they are a concrete example of the fact that, like the, fi the Five Star Movement is my favorite example because they're neither left nor right, and I used to get a lot of attack. I went to Italy to meet with them and I got attacked. Oh, you're meeting with them, they're anti, you know. Okay, so they're neither left nor right. They call themselves a movement, yet they're the third largest political party in, in Italy. They just won the mayorship in Rome. They literally are, const they've only been around five years and are constantly winning elections and moving forward at the same time as they give decision-making power to their members. So what, I'm, what I literally, my answer would be, study what's going on in Europe and ignore the negative press that it gets and instead say, how is it these movements, Podemos, for example, within like six months of its launch became like the third largest political party. I mean, it's insane the growth that these, that these so, that they're electoral social movements. They're social movements that protest by winning elections. This is, it's amazing. So we need to import that into America. Could you give examples of, I'll put these in quotes, successful or good uh, protests that are for um, what I'll call groups that you find reprehensible, or say on, on, on the other side of, of what you personally believe in or, or would strive to make happen? Does that question make sense? Mm. <laughs> um, I would say, you know what, actually, I think if you're looking for so looking abroad again in terms of protests that I think are, are effective but reprehensible at the same time, um, Russia has a lot of good examples. They have been doing, they have, they have like, they use, the, there's these Russian activists who use like shaming via video like extremely effectively against, they did some tax on LGBT, you know, but they also did on like people who were, um, there was like a whole campaign about people driving in like on sidewalks and stuff and they would like stop them and like plaster like uh, signs across their windows and get into these fights and then film the whole thing and release it. So extremely edgy physical confrontation around various issues that we might find, you know, reprehensible um, would be the first thing that, that comes to mind for me. 
I don't know if you call it a success, but it was definitely provocative. I've spent more time studying in person and uh, the Tea Party, so I'm going to use an example from the Tea Party. Um, so the Tea Party starts um, and people start meeting in groups around the country. And there's actually fairly regular meetings for the first six months. And then the meetings drop off. As they, as, uh, but you wouldn't know that from the media. Because one of the things, there are a few different groups, there actually ended up being five different Tea Party groups. Um, that imagine indivisible, you have lots of meetings that chose to fund people to go around and talk with those groups, educate them in both an ideology, by the way, they were just mad at the banks, not just mad at the banks, there's a lot of different sources of Tea Party movement, but um, uh, the initial, b the beginning was the bailout of the banks, that was sort of the, the, the lead. So um, Americans for Prosperity, again with a lot of money, so I just want to be clear, spent a lot of money um, sending trainers to events, they read Martin Luther King, they read Gandhi, they shared an ideology, so sort of introduced an ideology to groups that were newly political, but not deeply political, didn't necessarily have a deep politics or a view about tax policy. And then um, had a profound relationship with the mainstream press. I think the, in this country, the press is incredibly important. Um, so that in most stories, you would then hear the Republican view, the Tea Party view, and the Democratic view. There wasn't like the Republican, the Democratic, the Occupy. You know, there wasn't sort of a mirroring. So there was two-thirds space, which then changed. Uh, there, was, there was a lot of pressure to create it as a party within a party. Um, incredibly effective use of the media at events. They would like really cater to the media, give them food, put them up front. Um, make sure that they were well loved at events. I went to an event on the Arizona border um, with uh, Arpaio as the main speaker. Uh, um, <laughs> uh, the only funny thing that happened there, somebody came to me because I was wearing a little sundress and was like, we hear there's a woman with a sundress who's not supposed to be here. Have you seen her? <laughs> <laughs> But, but that, that aside, there was sort of a serious effort to take, and I, I think about this a lot in this indivisible moment, because I think there's a lot of newly political people and a real opportunity to create connections uh, between these newly politicized um, groups. Uh, yes, just in the second row. Yes, you Uh, uh, again, going back a couple of generations into Hannah Arendt, uh, again, I come from a generation that immigrated in World War II, and there was a different issue. Well, not different issue, but that's what we're talking about in a certain way. And what I wanted to begin, the, the, the concept of what you're talking about is power, powerlessness, she brought up in the concept of political space. And again, it struck me just recently uh, anyone who's read H.G. Uh, Adler, this thesis that experience, and talking, again, there was conflict there with Hannah Arendt and a number of issues, but what he was talking about, the concept that got me, that really has, we've been skirting, is the concept of, uh, of a coerced community. There's a difference. In, and it's not it really has to do somewhere with tribalism, but whether how coerced a particular community is and how it responds vis-a-vis -vis power and powerlessness. For instance, just recently I was at a, a conference where they were talking about what's going on in Chicago with the great gangs and the murderers and something of that sort. And there you have a. a, a the ability of a coercion on a community to cause the community to self-destruct in a certain way. And there's another way in which you have the thorough effect of, well, saying, well, you were coerced to a certain way, that I, but I can still get out of it without getting harmed. And, and that, there's, that's a power and powerlessness looked at from a, a sort of different angle. It's not, I think it's more that when you're talking about power, is that you don't want to let a, a community get to the point that is so coerced that it has to turn on itself. I think that's an interesting point. It's a new concept to me, so I would have to honestly think about it. Um, I think 
I don't know. The whole thing about Chicago, I think a lot of it really is the destruction of public housing, which is a kind of um, issue that I'm focused on. So I'll give you a tangential, completely unrelated answer, which is that if I were to predict right now what the next big social movement protest will be, I tell you it's going to be poor people, public housing. If you start looking into this issue, it's global. It's playing out in New York very strongly, New York City and other countries. So, and, it, and it connects to this, this question of what's going on in Chicago. So. Um, but in terms of course, communities, I have to think about that. Let's take one more question. So this is a student question. It's a student from the 60s, though. Um, I, I want to take issue with your notion that uh, protest is, in effect, of looking at the protests from 2003 on No to War, whether it's Occupy Wall Street or it's uh, Black Lives Matter. Um, I don't think George Bush was any more resolved or committed to principle than Lyndon Johnson was in 1968. In fact, I doubt he is as strong an individual as Johnson. The problem isn't um, that the, the dynamic has changed. The problem is that protests are not at the level where they're going to have any impact in the United States. We have very strong processes and institutions here. If you want to see the type of protest that works, you look at Ken Burns' documentary and what was going on between 1965 and 1968. And we haven't seen anything like that. And with all due regard to poor people and housing in New York, that's not going to generate the type of um, multi-community collective action that we saw in the 60s that crossed a whole political spectrum, that crossed all sorts of identity politics. And, you know, Mark Lilla has a, a take on this issue here. But if we just stay with protests based on an identity politics, rather than generating protest for a core issue that goes across the whole area, I don't know if we have that issue today in America the way we did in, in civil rights in Vietnam in the 60s. Um, but unless we have that type of dynamic, protest is going to be limited to very local issues like fracking in upstate New York. There you can have some type of impact. But outside of that, you need to build a protest structure and a movement that is massively greater than anything we've seen over the last 30 years. No, this is, no you're, I disagree with you entirely. I think, no, I really do. And I think that what you've just said is, I mean, it is so indicative of a way of thinking. It always, it's like the same script. It's like, listen, everybody, you're just not doing it like we did in the 60s. You're not big enough, okay? It's not true. It's not true. And as someone who has been an activist, since the age of 13, I have been listening and I trusted you up until 2012 when Occupy was, was defeated. Okay? I spent my life trying to realize, oh, if only we could create something as big as the protests. And this. We did with Occupy. We were bigger than you. We were bigger. I'm sorry. We spread to more countries and we were active more intensely for a more concentrated period of time. Okay, so I completely disagree with what you just said. I think that, I think that in activism, we all have to follow our revolutionary t intuition and let people follow your, your advice to their peril. Meanwhile, I think that it is beholden for us to look forward and say there is something fundamentally broken about that paradigm because even if the protests were as large as you are saying they need to be, there is no constitutional requirement, there is no requirement at all that the government has to listen to it. That's what's broken. This is why I brought up the question of sovereignty. What is broken is that back then, there was some sort of assumption that if you grew to a certain size, you had to be listened to or else. Because people believed in revolution back then. But today, it is not true. So I just, frankly, I disagree with you. And the second thing I want to say with your quick dismissal about the, the poor people and the, and the public housing. I, I, I remember the days before Occupy Wall Street, and I would tell everyone about this movement that's going to happen. It's going to blow up. It's going to be amazing. You got to, you know, I got to tell you about it. No one believed me. That is my experience of activism. The best ideas are precisely the ones that seem to make no sense, okay? But my revolutionary intuition tells me that poor people and public housing is, is an issue that will galvanize across demographics because it affects affordable housing. Six, listen, 400,000 people in New York City live in public housing. It's like one out of 14 New Yorkers. 44% of people in Hong Kong live in public housing. 
Public housing has become this, this, this hidden thing. So I don't want to like sit up here and convince you about it because I, I believe it to be true. Just mark my words. So I really, but, and I, what I find in your quick dismissal is actually evidence because you would have said the same thing to me about that before Occupy Wall Street. So I really just want to caution the younger and older activists, stop chasing that paradigm of the 60s. Just let it go. It was great. You guys were awesome, but just let it go. Let it go. On that note, uh, I don't know if it's pessimistic. Thank you very much. Just, uh, just, just a, just a quick uh, announcement. Uh, there, oh. there, can you turn this on? Dennis is probably pulled.